A man may be born, but in order to be born, he must first die. And in order to die, he must first awake. And that's what's happened to me over the last 11 years, is I had to die as a hospital guy, and I've been reborn as a, I guess, a, a mineral, self-taught mineral expert. Um, I get up every morning, 5 o'clock, read for three or four hours. I've read a lot of articles. And it's amazing what's in the literature if you know how to ask the right questions. <clears throat> without self-knowledge, without understanding the working and functions of his machine, man cannot be free, he cannot govern himself, and he will always remain a slave. And that's where we find ourselves today. We've been subjected to 18 months of torture because they want us to be enslaved because we don't understand how our body works. Complete ignorance around it. And these are the thoughts of G.I. Gudrun. He's a Russian philosopher, for heaven's sakes. He's not a physician. Very thoughtful guy. Well, the problem we've got is we don't understand what the problem is. We think we know what it is, but we really don't understand the problem. And this is our biggest challenge. We don't know what we don't know. And, and every practitioner you've ever been to, their diploma was printed on Swiss cheese. And there's gaping holes in what they don't know. But they pretend to know. And it's, this is across all forms of healing. But there's glaring defects because doctors are not taught about mineral metabolism. They're not taught about oxygen metabolism. And they're not taught about energy metabolism. And because they don't know about minerals, oxygen, and energy, they can't possibly understand what the problem is. So they've been trained to focus on the enemies, right? We're back to Pasteur and Bechamp, right? Particle versus field. And they're really good at fighting the enemies. We've just been through 18 months of torture chasing an enemy, and turns out the whole basis of COVID, it's an energy crisis. But nobody's talking about that. That's the real, the essence of the problem is we don't understand the problem because we don't, we're so preoccupied with enemies. My, my catchphrase now is ignore the enemies, ignite the energy. And there are mechanisms to do that. So we do have an energy crisis on this planet. It's enormous in its scope, and it's not properly understood. But fortunately, people are beginning to realize that enemies are not the problem. They're, they're a factor. Of course, they're important. But what, what, is, what do the bugs do? They live on iron. I, I had the opportunity to talk to Douglas Kell, preeminent scientist in England, iron biologist. He's got this wall of books behind him, and he's recently knighted, and he agreed to talk with me. And he starts the conversation and says, you know, Morley, I really enjoyed your video. I said, you looked at it? He said, oh, yeah, it was really good. He said, um, but I want to make sure you know something. I said, what's that? He said, you're spot on about the pathogens. He said, every pathogen on the planet feeds on iron. I went, thank you. It's good to know. And what, what regulates the pathogens and what regulates iron and what regulates oxygen? Copper. Wouldn't that be pretty cool if doctors actually knew that, if they understood that? And if they knew that there's a difference between copper and bioavailable copper? That'd be really good to know. So here's where we get into trouble. It's not what we know. It's not what we don't know, excuse me. It's what we know for certain. So I just came across this study 
and I apologize for the eye test. So can you tell me in the back row what that says? <laughs> no, this is a study that just, this was actually published on March of 2020. I just discovered it yesterday. I'm embarrassed it took me that long. But it's basically talking about a simple blood test to find out if you're going to die from COVID. Does anybody care about that? It's actually amazing. And it's called the RDW blood test, red blood cell distribution width. And what most people don't know is that when your red blood cells are too fat, they've got too much iron. Why do they have too much iron? Because you don't have enough copper in your body. And the whole iron recycling system of the body is based on bioavailable copper. Again, I think that'd be pretty cool if they taught that in doctor school. So basically what this is laying out is this elevated RDW is a proven predictor. If you go into the hospital with COVID, and I don't think anyone in this room is going to do that, but if you know of someone, that would be the test that they're going to take to see if they're going to live or not. That's important to know. Elevated red blood cell distribution width. And it's found in a CBC test. It's, a, it's like a $10 blood test. It was first identified in 1910 by a physician in London, England. And this is the guy you should pay homage to. His name is Maxwell Weintraub. He's the godfather of the RCP. He was originally from Canada, got his medical degree there, got a PhD from Tulane University. And he headed up the creation of the medical school at the University of Utah in the 1950s. And very smart guy, and why I really admire him. This is the textbook that he wrote. It's the first textbook on hematology that was ever uh, published. Um, I actually own a copy. I haven't read it, but, it, but I own it. Um, but the, the important thing is he spearheaded a decades of copper research at the University of Utah. If you really want to get into the weeds of why copper is important, you look up Max Weintraub. You look up uh, George Cartwright. You look up Lee Williams. These were the demigods back then that understood why copper was so important. But his real claim to fame was he really understood RDW and why it was so copper dependent. Because the, the reticulocytes, let me go geek on you for a second, the reticulocytes that become red blood cells, they get all full of iron before they are released as red blood cells. And they've got to be able to let that iron go. But they've also got to be able to make energy. Because if you don't have energy, you can't let the iron go. So you've got to have copper to make energy. Oh, yeah, and that, that doorway, the ferroportin doorway what, that lets the iron out, it's a copper doorman that opens the door so the iron can get out. So what is COVID? COV stands for copper's vanished. ID, iron's dominant. The whole thing is a fight between copper and iron. How many of you were taking the COVID cocktail over the last year and a half? Ascorbic acid and zinc and vitamin D. Anybody? What you didn't know is it was depleting your copper in your body. Ding, ding, ding. It, what, what amazes me is they're always moving the cheese on us, right? And so the very people that, that brought us COVID, you know, Anthony Fauci, right? Then he's telling us what to do to prevent it. And we, we actually listened to him for a while. It's like, oh my gosh, we got to stop that. So again, these are, these are bloated red blood cells. That's not good. They're full of iron. And I can, I can, I can make a, a prediction. In this room, in this building, in this town, in this city, in this country, everyone has too much iron. Why? Because you don't have enough copper in your system to spit at. Why? Because you've been eating the North American diet. The 
And so this whole process of managing red blood cells is copper dependent. And we don't, you know, I, I teach a class 16 weeks, and even if I had 16 weeks right now, I couldn't tell you about what that slide really means. But just, just understand copper is really important because we live on a planet that has oxygen, right? Oxygen is the second most reactive element on the planet after fluoride. I'm not going to let you sit down. <laughs> um, second most reactive element on the planet, oxygen, after fluoride. And there's only one element that can activate it and turn it into water. There's only one element that can deactivate the oxidants and turn them into either hydrogen peroxide or water. There's only one element that can activate what are called oxidase enzymes. And the, what does that mean? It means you're taking oxygen and taking advantage of the energy that it has for a reaction. And there's only one element that combats all enemies on the planet, and that's copper. Copper does it all. And it's not taught anywhere except in the RCP Institute. And my book that you're going to buy, right? Yeah. I mean, I bought a bunch, and I, I'm not going to take them with me. OK. The part that we don't understand is the metabolism of our body. That's where we all fall down. And the reason why I chose that title, Cure Your Fatigue, is that energy deficiency is the start of every condition in the Merck Manual. As soon as there's energy loss, what that means is oxygen is not being activated, being turned into water to release the energy molecules. And as soon as that happens, you're making hydrogen peroxide. And why is hydrogen peroxide a problem? Because that's another way of spelling inflammation. Inflammation is not a disease. It's a state of piss poor energy production. That's what it really means. And it means that copper is not available to do its job. Again, the whole process of making energy is copper dependent. And you probably have never heard that. And the, the beauty of it is it's in the literature. There are scores and scores and scores of articles that talk about it. But you've got to be able to ask the right questions of Dr. Google. And so this is a stylized picture of the mitochondria. So there's the mitochondria. And this is what's called the electron transport chain. And then when you attach complex 5 to it, it becomes what's called oxidative phosphorylation. We all know that, right? So. The part that we didn't know is that what the literature loves to tell us is that there are problems inside the mitochondria that prevent it from doing its job. And they love to talk about aging and genetic mutations. And they love to talk about uh, all sorts of uh, production of like uh, alpha synuclein, especially if you've got Parkinson's, things like that. But what they're not telling you is that there's never any mention of the word iron. And if you really want to understand aging, you got to learn how to spell iron. I-R-O-N. So I bet a bunch of you have your phones, which has a calculator. I want you to get out your, your phone. And I want you to multiply your age times 365 and just start calling out numbers. Your age times 365. What are some numbers? 25,185. 20,805. What's that? OK. So what that's telling you is that's a really cool formula for knowing how many milligrams of iron in your body that I learned from Robert Crichton, who's the reigning iron biologist on planet Earth. 
And he said, well, Marla, you know that, that there, we, we accumulate a milligram of iron every day around the planet. I said, well, yeah, because I've read, I've read your articles, I've read your book. So women should have 4,000 milligrams of iron, and guys should have about 5,000. And if you have a multiple of that, which most people do, it means copper's not doing its job in your body. Yeah. There's a difference between iron in the blood and iron in the tissue. Big difference. And Bruce Ames, some of you may know that name. He was a, a very famous scientist. At one point, in, at the reign of his, at the height of his career, he was the most quoted scientist on planet Earth. He did a study in 2004, and what did he discover? That there's 10 times more iron in the tissue than shows up in the blood. And what does it take to get iron out of the tissue and into the blood is copper, right? It's too simple, right? Yeah, right. I just literally have Literally, okay. <laughs> and you survived it. That's great. Well, yeah, but I have pernicious anemia. <gasps> oh my gosh. And, but I, but how Not the pernicious anemia. <laughs> but I'm just telling you what they told me. But I'm just saying, I actually went in for an infusion, and I'm like, I think they're trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> So we can, we can leave now. We've just figured out what the problem is. 1937. Look up 19. Look up the Nobel Prize in 1937, and you're going to discover that three physicians, two from Hopkins, one from Harvard, got the Nobel Prize for using the same product to cure anemia and pernicious B12 anemia. You know what that product is? Beef liver. They got a Nobel Prize for giving patients beef liver. Now, here's the catch. You've got to be grass-fed. You've got to know the farmer. You've got to know that the farmer knows that the soil needs to be fed minerals. What's the most important mineral? Copper, right. You're going to live. <laughs> but, but you need to do a different blood test. Okay. Yeah. And you, you write me a note, and I'll tell you what it is. But let's all say a prayer for, for Donna. Yeah. She, you, you, the most important thing is to understand the difference between iron in the tissue, iron in the blood. That's where the catch is. Because we've been trained to think, and doctors have been trained to think, that they're one and the same. Oh, no. So these are the areas where copper plays a critical role inside the mitochondria. I think that, I think that'd be really cool if people actually knew that. It's absolutely stunning. We're talking about the center in the. the first of all, the, does anybody know how many mitochondria we have in our body? I'm sure it's common knowledge, right? Forty quadrillion mitochondria in our body. We have 100 trillion cells, so it's about 500 mitochondria in our in each cell. So go back to your high school biology textbook, and there was one or two mitochondria. We don't have a clue how complicated it is inside the cell and who's really running the show. It's not the nucleus. The nucleus is a Xerox machine in the corner. And guess what happens if you unplug a Xerox machine? It doesn't work, does it? And the, and the mitochondria are a network. It's an incredible web. Of, of communication, absolutely amazing. And it's all driven by copper. We, we, Dr. Liz, the troublemaker back here, she's the one who started all this. She's my midwife. Um, but we were meeting with some physicians up in um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And this, this one MD, were, the, the purpose of the meeting was they were going to dress me down about vitamin D. And after three hours, they were humbled by what I knew and what they didn't know. And then this one physician, when we got into the discussion about copper, he says, oh my gosh, now I understand. I said, what? He said, all the medications that we use in allopathic medicine are enzyme inhibitors. 
and they're blocking either magnesium or copper. And what do you need in order to make energy? You gotta have magnesium or copper or both. Th this is the impact that copper has on iron utilization. Most important thing to know is that for every, I'm not gonna bump you. Now that I know you're wounded, I'm gonna be really careful. No, um, for every atom of copper in our body, there's 60 atoms of iron. In the, in the world of, of homeopathy, copper is called the general, and iron is called the foot soldier. Iron is dumber than a box of rocks. And it needs to be told what to do, where to do it, how to do it. And what they love to tell you about, all the things that iron does in the body, and 100% of those six activities, like carrying oxygen. Do you realize that 80% of the iron in your body is carrying oxygen? It's a dumb waiter. That's all it is. It's just carrying oxygen. But, but in order to, so, so we've got this iron thingy that's a waiter, and who's copper? Copper's the five-star chef, slicing and dicing the oxygen so you can make energy out of it. So what this slide is pointing out is highlighting the critical areas of iron utilization that are all copper dependent. They don't work without copper. Every facet of iron metabolism is copper dependent. And so when the doctor tells you that you're anemic, smile, thank them for their concern, go to the rcp123.org website and start doing the root cause protocol. And there's a series of stops. The first three things we talk about is stop taking vitamin D. Stop taking ascorbic acid. Stop taking zinc. For heaven's sakes, don't take iron. It's the worst thing you can put inside your body, unless you have perfect copper. And I've, I've yet to meet someone, and I've done 6,500 consults. So, yeah, go ahead. Zinc, yeah. She wanted to know about what were the three supplements that we first start with by saying stop. Stop the vitamin C, ascorbic acid, Stop the vitamin D, I'm a heretic, and stop zinc. Why do we do that? They reduce copper. So zinc stimulates the mucal cells in our digestive tract. They stimulate the production of a protein called metallothionine. Metallothionine is designed to bind up metals. And it binds up copper a thousand times stronger than it binds up zinc. So effectively, zinc takes copper offline. Ascorbic acid. Gosh, everybody's taking ascorbic acid. Don't you understand we need that? It's poison to copper metabolism. There's a very important protein in our body called ceruloplasmin. Can you say that? Ceruloplasmin, because that'll be on the test at the end. C-E-R-U-L-O. P is in Peter, L-A-S-M-I-N, discovered in 1948 by two Swedish scientists, Holmberg and Laurel. They thought they had discovered the Holy Grail. This was amazing. And Big Pharma has been demonizing it ever since. Why? Because it expresses 24 enzymes. You want some roller skates? I can do that. You want a skateboard? Yeah, we, we can do a skateboard. Oh, you would like a bike? I can do a bike. You want a motorcycle? I can do a motorcycle. Would you rather have a car? I can do a car. Do you want a boat? I can do a boat. Do you want a rocket? I can do rockets. And that's ceruloplasmin. And doctors are not taught about it, except for one lecture about Wilson's disease where one person in 40,000 gets Wilson's disease. There's 7,500 people in the United States that get Wilson's disease, and I think doctors get a prize when they find a patient with it, like a 
Cracker Jacks. Most important protein on planet Earth. And it's not taught in any doctor school. Uh, humble request. Uh, we can see your lips. We can hear you. So Got it. You, you want me up here? All right, so I can't go past here. Okay. All right. And I can't bump your knee, right? Okay. Okay. No, it's, the, the world is lost because it doesn't understand minerals. Right. And uh, quercetin. So, if I said that right, but, so you're saying not to take that. Right. D mm -hmm. Because I really care about you guys. No, I understand that, but I'm just saying it's amazing how many doctors are saying to take that. So, so ask your doctor how many hours of nutrition did you get in? in I'm, I'm, and I am too. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the, the, the more natural, the better, but then you've got to get back to the soil. Is the soil, does it have the minerals to feed the plant system? Again, we've been, we've been deluded to think, oh, I can just go in any store, get any product. If it's got the right name, then I, it's all the same. I bet, I bet if we were to take a survey, probably every person in this room is driving a different type of car, right? And they're all engineered differently. I drive used BMWs. Why do I drive used BMWs? I can't afford new ones, but I love the engineering of a BMW. And that's what you want in your supplements. Whoops, I've crossed the line. So, yeah, I know. But no, but you want to get the best engineered supplements you can find because the body recognizes good engineering. So the thing is, this enzyme, it's called ferrochelatase, fetch. You know, you play fetch with your dog. So that's a copper enzyme. And you can't make heme without fetch. And fetch doesn't work without copper. You all remember what it's like for your birthday and you get a present and your parents forgot to put the battery in, right? It's a real bummer, right? Because you can't play with the toy. Well, there are hundreds of enzymes in your body that need to have a copper battery. Now, what, what um, Joseph Prohaska, very stuffy copper expert who's now retired, will tell you is, well, there are 11 copper enzymes. That's all you need to know. And what just came to, to light uh, in 2018, Dr. Comstra, C-O-M-S-T-R-A, discovered that there's 541 proteins that key off of ATP7A. And you're like, well, what's he talking about? Well, ATP7A and ATP7B are the copper loading enzymes that run our body. So one enzyme keys off 541 other ones. So the, the number of copper enzymes, nobody knows. It, and if it does exist, it's all suppressed. And this is the work of, of Dr. Williams. He worked with Dr. Um, Weintraub at the University of Utah. Basically what they're saying here is, in order to recycle iron inside the mitochondria, you gotta have copper. It's so basic. And what, what's really important to understand is that we've got these 40 quadrillion mitochondria and the model for human mitochondria is yeast. Think about that. They use yeast to study human mitochondria. A guy named Paul Cobine, Auburn University, 2004, 2006, discovers that there's 50,000 atoms of copper in each yeast mitochondria, which means there's 50,000 that are supposed to be in our mitochondria. And you can do the math real quick, 50,000 times 40 quadrillion. That's a real big number, but it actually syncs up with the amount of copper we need in order to run our body. But I don't think anyone in this room has 50,000 per mitochondria, because we didn't know. Not known, because not looked for. 
most dangerous words that are taught in um, clinical training. So in heme assembly, you can't, you can't make iron sulfur clusters. Again, you can't make heme. All of these functions are copper dependent. And I, I, know, I don't mean to, to dizzy you with all this material, but I, I want you to walk out of here with sort of a wow factor, like, gosh, maybe, maybe copper is more important than I realized. Maybe I need to teach my doctor this. Good luck. It's a, it's a real tough conversation to have. <clears throat> and this is really where the rubber hits the road. We're inside the mitochondria. And there's this substance called labile iron. Now, L. Ron Hubbard has a famous saying, never go past a word you don't know the definition of. So I ignored that for about three years. I thought, labile iron, it's happy iron. It's, it's doing great things. It's, and then I found out that labile means highly reactive, toxic. It's really bad. So that changed my understanding of hundreds of studies that I've been looking at. <clears throat> but what's important is there's a very close relationship between labile iron inside the cell and aging. How about that? Every symptom of aging is too much iron in your cells. It's not being, iron's not being recycled properly. Iron's not being used properly. And so we're told that aging, well, the, the iron sulfur, excuse me, the heme biosynthesis starts to slow down because of aging. Oh my God, they, they actually think we're gonna believe that. No, it's iron. Iron's getting in the way. It's creating oxidative stress. It's creating a rise of nitric oxide. How many people think that nitric oxide is your friend? Yeah, you want to do some research. Nitric oxide is a poison inside the mitochondria because it'll shut down complex four in a nanosecond. And that's where oxygen becomes water to release energy. Again, a Nobel Prize, 1998, three physicians get the Nobel Prize for ENOS. And we thought they were helping us. Oh. M, G. Iron sulfur cluster biosynthesis starts to, f to flag when we are aging. No, iron is building. You, you've heard the numbers here, 20,000, 26,000. That's what's, that's what's gumming up the works. Then we can't, can't get hydrogen. Hydrogen can't be pumped out. And if we can't pump out hydrogen, then we can't make ATP. It's a big problem. And so the word that's used in the literature, because you probably can't see that word, the word is stress. Oh, you've got a lot of stress in your life. If you have stress in your world, does anybody have stress in their world? Yeah, right? So if you have stress in your world, you have oxidative stress building in your cells. And that's the code. The scientists and the clinicians know what stress means, wink, wink. They know what stress is referring to. Oxidative stress, nitrosative stress. And when these gases get stressed out, that's when our disease process starts because energy starts to tank. It's, it's, no, more, it's no more complicated than that. Energy deficiency. Douglas Wallace at uh, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, 2005. The start of all disease is energy deficiency. And he says, it would be a good thing if allopathic physicians knew that. Not me, Douglas Wallace. He's the guy that figured out the seven faces of Eve. He's the guy that figured out that mitochondrial DNA flows from the mother. He's a really smart guy. He'll get a Nobel Prize, hopefully. He, he actually deserves it, unlike some people. Um, but this is really what mitochondria look like in our body. It's a network. It's a very complicated network. And what's it surrounding? The nucleus, because the nucleus needs energy, right? So if you don't have magnesium, you can't run the Krebs cycle, and you can't attach 
the final phosphorus, phosphate, excuse me, at complex five. But if you don't have copper, you got a big problem. I think it's important to know that. And it's not complicated to restore those minerals, but you've got to stop following the edicts of the go crazy COVID crowd. You just, you, 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 the, the tragedy is we, we don't know what's the truth on the internet. Just because it's a printed word doesn't mean it's telling you the truth. And so if there's oxidative stress in the mitochondria, it's going to affect the DNA in the mitochondria. So you've got two forms of DNA, mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA. And we've been trained, like circus bears, to be worried about the nuclear DNA, right? There's 16 times more oxidative stress in the mitochondria. This is where the crisis is. This is where energy stops being produced. But they don't talk about that, do they? This is a simple process of what oxidative stress does. Again, if you have stress in your world, you have oxidative stress in your body, and you go from having a normal cell to having free radicals. Doesn't that sound sweet? They're free. Have as many as you want, right? They're free. Free radicals. I mean, the, 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 the vocabulary of medicine is fascinating. And then we have a cell that is absolutely overwhelmed with oxidative stress. Too many electrons, too much hydroxyl radicals, too much hydrogen peroxide, and so on. And so this is a different way of presenting this. This is the fun side. This is more complicated. What, what's important to know is it's copper that's saving us all over the cell, stopping the oxidative stress. And what's important to understand, you ready? Okay. Um, what's important to understand is as soon as copper goes south, nitric oxide goes north. It's a conserved response in our physiology. And you've got to get beyond the, oh, nitric oxide is good for me. It is not good for you because it shuts down copper enzymes. And that's the work of Torres and Wilson, 1998, and a number of other studies. So the whole problem is, it's called redox cycling pathology. It's another RCP. So what the, what the RCP that's discussed in this book, the root cause protocol, what the RCP does is it stops redox cycling pathology. What it also does is it stops real creepy parasites and many other things. There's many different forms of RCP. So what does hypoxia mean? What's that? Low oxygen, right? We know that's what it means. It means we're up on Mount Everest, right? <gasps> Gasping for, for air, right? No. Hypoxia is low bioavailable copper at a cellular level. And the cell cannot activate oxygen. What would be the worst possible thing you could do to someone who's old Struggling with oxygen. What's that? Ventilate them. Ventilate them or give them an oxygen tank. They don't have any copper in their body. What are they going to do with all that copper? It's going to turn into rust. Again, if, if we, it, the challenge we've got in this room is there's one test that needs to be done, it's called the ferrooxidase colometric assay. F-E-R-R-O-X-I-D-A-S-E colometric 
assay. It's a $4 test. Four whole dollars. And guess what? The Food and Drug Administration, the Facilitate Death in America Administration, does not allow, does not allow that critical copper test because here's the, here's the whole conundrum of copper. I spell conundrum differently. It's C-U hyphen, right? Conundrum. So all of the literature will tell you about the level of copper in this particular subject. That's like knowing the height of your children. The level of copper. And because we can't do the ferrooxidase colometric assay, we don't know how smart that copper is. We don't know its activity. And because we don't know its activity, we have no friggin' clue what's going on inside the body as it relates to oxygen, iron, and energy. And that's where everything starts. Yeah. You, you, can't, you can't get it. You can't get that test. Oh, no, yeah, if you're a rat, you could get the test. But you're a two-legged rat, and you can't get the test. So what you get is you get, you get ceruloplasma, right? Okay, say it. Ceruloplasma, right? And you get copper, and you take the ratio of copper to ceruloplasma, and that ratio should be 3.33. And that's as close as we can get to rational understanding of copper. But even that's crude. And so I'm, I'm probably going to end on this slide, just because it's really busy. But, but the point of this slide is to explain what's really happening with hypoxia. Our cells are designed to understand that there's a lack of oxygen. Again, oxygen was not always on this planet. And copper is what saved all life on this planet many, many years ago. And what the conserved response, when the, when the cell goes what's called functionally hypoxic, when it gets functionally hypoxic, therefore copper cannot activate oxygen and make energy, this doorway, CTR1, copper transporter 1, opens up and says, Ollie, Ollie, in free. Any copper that's out there, please come in. We need you. And it goes to this tra transporter, ATOX1, which then feeds ATP7A, the Minkies pump. Not milk monkey, Minkies. And that copper is supposed to go into ceruloplasma, so that the body can breathe again, so that the cells can respire. That's the conserved physiological response to hypoxia. But wait, there's more. There's a catch. It turns out, has anyone in this room ever eaten anything with high fructose corn syrup? Right? Never, right? Shuts this doorway down. On an airplane is where you find it. <laughs> That'd be the first place I'd go to find it. Yeah, enriched, enriched flour and high fructose corn syrup. Yeah, right, okay. So high fructose corn syrup shuts that down. You probably have heard of Roundup, right? You know, glyphosate. I, I once had an opportunity to, to meet with Stephanie Seneff, and I was in a meeting sitting across from her at a breakfast table, and she said, Morley, would you like to know why glyphosate is so dangerous to copper? I went, oh my God, I felt like I had died and gone to heaven. So turns out glyphosate chelates copper down to a pH of one. Do you think, do you think that's just a coincidence? The antibiotics that you've been using throughout your life very typically will shut down 40% of the copper metabolism in your liver. You think that's a mistake? Again, what does COVID stand for? Copper's vanished, iron's dominant. It's not complicated, folks. It really isn't. 
And so the body has this response. And what the, what the RCP, what this book is designed to do, you can't live without this book. But what, this, but what, the, what the book explains is how to make more of the ceruloplasm thing. Because Donna needs it. She doesn't have enough ceruloplasm because she's showing up low iron in the blood. And that's what happened. OK, um, we have a couple minutes. If, any questions? Yeah. Right. Um, do flies cause garbage? Do flies cause garbage? It's association. Yeah. And why is the vitamin D low? Be good to know that, right? Why is vitamin D low? So the reason why vitamin D is low is because the enzyme in your liver to make the kind of vitamin D they're studying requires magnesium. Well, why is magnesium low in the liver? Oh, yeah, because the iron's high in the liver. Oh, but why is iron high in the liver? Because when you have no copper in your diet, ferritin in the liver takes off like a rocket and accumulates iron. Wouldn't it be good for people to know that? And then when you take vitamin D, what does it do? It kills copper metabolism. Ding, ding, ding. It's almost like they know that. Yeah, they're in the book. Really, really simple. Yeah. Bee pollen, bee pollen, bee pollen, real vitamin C. The one I like is innate response. No ascorbic acid, please. And then everyone's favorite. Grass-fed beef liver. I have a, I've, again, I've done 6,500 consults. I have a sheet of paper with 12 names on it of the 12 people who got excited they should be eating beef liver because everyone else says like, oh my God, I hate that. But grass-fed beef liver is a rich source of copper. Excuse me? Whose side are you on? I mean, seriously, come on. There's no, wait, 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 wait. There's no money in healthy humans. You know that. And there's no money in dead humans. There, there is. The ancestral diet, if it, if it was raised on food that was properly nourished by the farmer, there's many, many, many sources. The mistake we make is thinking, oh, well, I'll eat mushrooms because that's a rich source of copper, not knowing how that mushroom was raised, or nuts and seeds, not knowing how those nuts and seeds were formed, or, oh, I'll get some peanuts because those are really, so what do they do? How do farmers grow peanuts now in between cotton? What do they do to the cotton? Spray it with glyphosate, and that gets on the peanuts. Yes. How many people in here are over 50 years old? You should all be donating blood once a quarter for the rest of your life. Lower the iron footprint, do the RCP, and you'll be amazed at how much better you feel. Ferritin, I've renamed it. It's called Ariton. It's where a lot of mistakes are made in medicine because doctors don't understand that the ferritin, there's actually four different types of ferritin. There's heavy chain and mitochondrial ferritin, both require copper. Light chain, not so much. But then there's serum ferritin. Well, where does serum ferritin come from? It comes from dysfunctional organs trying to recycle the iron, and it gets, the iron gets dumped into the organ, and the empty protein gets secreted into the blood. Serum ferritin is empty shotgun shells, and doctors don't understand that.
It's empty shotgun shells. The iron's already been dumped in the in the tissue. Yeah. Absolutely. As soon as you have stress, you have mineral loss. <clears throat> Acute stress, you lose magnesium. Chronic stress, you lose copper. And this was actually first theorized by Dr. Fiedler in 1899. It's, it's the stress model of physiology. Yeah. Dr. Ben Edwards, who's a colleague of mine in Lubbock, Texas, he's, a, he's an MD, he and I are coming out with a copper product at the end of the year called Paleo Copper and Vegan Copper. And the name of his uh, company is called Veritas Market. That'll be available at the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> Anything's possible. But what you've overlooked is being poisoned with iron your whole life, being poisoned with food chemicals your whole life. So is there a chance something could happen? Yes. You, lightning can strike us, right? Well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. And, and I, I make it very clear how to do it. And Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> The book is so easy to understand. <laughs> now, I had, I had a guest writer. It's been through many iterations. I hope it's easier to understand. I, I realize that this is kind of mind-blowing. But, but what you have to understand is that everything we've been taught is a lie. Everything. And it's really upsetting to think about that, because we think we're pretty smart. Well, they can't fool me. Well, they fooled us on every level. We don't have a chance to go into it. It's going to kick me out of here. So thank you all very much for coming. Appreciate it.